G'day and welcome back to my channel. Now, as you can see, a lot of work has been done on the Constructo Bounty since my last video. I have all of the first layer of planking in, the bow and the stern have been chocked, and they've all been sanded back nice and smooth. So I am now ready for the second layer of planks, which is what this video will be about. But I also want to talk about a few other things, because on this side, which I did previously, I'd use some tried and true basic methods to fix a few things. Like you have a problem when three planks needs to go down to two planks so that you know you can continue the the um, the run. And I had a terrible butt join there, but I've replaced that and I've put in a joggle plank. And similarly down here, I had some wedges in stern, which is fine, which is what you do. But I have now cut those out and replaced them with steelers. So steelers and joggles, yeah, funny names. I'm going to talk about those in this video because I'm going to plan for them this time and do a better job of basically running my planks along and expanding them out or thinning them down as needs be. So that's what this video will be about. It'll be my work up to date. I'll show you how I've got to this stage. I'll explain everything. And then we'll get into discussion about joggle planks and steelers and how we use them. Sound interesting? Okay, roll the music. So the bounty is finally taking shape and it really does look like a boat now. It doesn't look like that mess that we had when I first acquired this kit and it was just all a big tangle of planks sort of poking in every direction. Now firstly, I'll talk about the chocking, because a lot of people got very confused, going, why are you only planking to there? Well, it's the first layer of planks, and this is a method so that you don't have to worry about trying to do all that tricky tapering and, and basically putting in your joggles and everything. You don't have to worry about that. You can simply just plank up to the easiest point. It's usually where it really starts to curve quite savagely, and especially on a ship like this that has a bluff bow, right? It has a blunt, big round bow. That's a hard curve to do, and we'll reserve that for when we have thinner planks in uh, the second layer. Now, I did have to curve that plank, and you can that's in my video, I think, number four, curving planks. I'll explain how to do that. But that was hard enough as it was. Imagine trying to do that with tapering everything. You can't do it. It's bloody hard work. An easier way is to just t basically do some minor tapering and take your planks to a point where things start to go all you know, curvy. And then in the curvy bit, you put some balsa. So I did that, put in some balsa there, also added some strips here where I needed to sort of give it a bit more strength, and I built that all up. Now that wasn't hard to do, all I had to do was measure the spaces between the formats that were there, like the bulkheads, slide in some balsa, and then pencil basically the biggest profile, cut my piece of balsa to that profile, and then I'd have a whole lot of chunky bits stepped down, as you'll see in the pics. And then once you've got sort of all those little pieces in there, it's sort of like a whole little steppy down Lego type thing, then you can come in and you can basically carve it and then sand it to shape. And I feel I did a much better job this time than I did on the last one. For some reason, I have a little dip here. You can't quite see it, but I know it's there. Yeah, there's a little dip. I don't know how I managed that. There's a little dead spot there, which should be a bit, a bit more rounded. But um, here I have got a lovely curve. And as always, when you do something the second time, you usually do a much better job. And it has been quite a while since I've actually built a wooden ship and done all this. So I'm working from memory, and I'm also trying new tricks. So I'm, you know, I'm often in the much in the dark as you are, but we're all learning together. Same here at the stern, the pieces were put in. Now, one thing will happen is, when you put your bolster pieces between the frames, you're still going to have the width of the frame left over. So what I ended up doing a lot of the time was, was just packing the frames as much as I could and then creating a piece that was a little bit wider but the thickness of the planks and placing that over the top. You probably see a photo here of some of the funny little shapes that I made. So they all went in, that all got basically put together and then the whole thing gets sanded as much as possible. And you've really got to get right down to the keel here. This is the dead area. Uh, strictly speaking, you probably should, should not have even any... Um, blocking there at all it really should just be 
keel on that whole triangle, but that's incredibly thin there. And I was really matching the work I'd done over here. But again, if I went back and did it again properly, I would make sure my dead area was kept dead. So that whole section there would just be the uh, false keel. And you would sand your, um, your planks here to nothing. Which I still could do, I suppose. But I'm kind of happy with the shape that I've got. At least it is going to uh, a thickness there which will be exactly right for the, um, the rudder to go. That's the thing. You're basically working towards the point where the rudder goes on. So you don't want to have this big and chunky and three planks thick because you've got all these layers. And then you put your rudder on and you're... Well, you can't have it like that, but it doesn't look that good. So what I need to do now is get the second layer of planks on. And it's pretty well the same method, but it's going to be a lot easier, believe you me. Now the sanding of this, well, this side I did by hand. Just sandpaper. And you can do that, but... I'm old and my bones are weary and my joints ache from arthritis and gout, so I um, sanded it and then had to spend a week in bed practically recovering. Yes, it's, it's a sad state of affairs. This side I went, look, I'm not going to suffer that again. There must be a better way. And I talked to Bernard and a few of my friends and a few other people that basically did wood models, and they talked about this tool from Black & Decker used to make called a mouse. Now, it's basically a little triangular-headed detail sander. I'll show you a pic. I couldn't find Black & Decker's mouse, I don't think they make it anymore, but I did manage to find at my local hardware store a similar item, uh, and I was just about to buy it, except the guy there went, what do you want that for? And I said, oh, I'm building wooden boats. He said, no, 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 I built radio control boats for years and blah, 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 know all about it, you need this. So he talked me into a slightly bigger machine, but he said, you'll have far more control with this. And I think he's right, because it is a whopping great big machine, it looks kind of scary, but I was able to get some really fine sanding done on this and have total control. And I did the entire hull half in less than half an hour. I mean, that took me three to four hours. And I was my arms were aching and I was fed up. And in some ways, I didn't do as good a job of sanding the first layer. So that that's why I've got a few little problems and a few little lumps and bumps on my second layer. I'm much more confident now this first layer has been sanded so smooth and I had the time to take, to run my hand over it, run the machine over it. So um, the purists would be probably horrified, but honestly, if you're getting on in the tooth a bit or if you just don't want to spend four hours sanding a bloody wooden boat, consider looking for a detail sander. I mean, talk to the guys at your hardware, see if you can find someone that knows about building wooden ships and they can advise you the best one to get. Mine's cordless, so it runs on batteries. I can go outside, make a big mess, and I'm not messing up the hobby room with lots and lots of sanding dust. All right, well, what I'd like to do now is talk about these steelers and joggles. Now, you may notice I've got a little tea towel down here that I'm resting the boat on. And the reason for this is when I was doing this side, I had it on my bench and I didn't really have much protection, I didn't think it needed it. And some of my tools slid underneath and I'm banging and walloping in planks on that side. And on this side, I'm getting massive big dents from hammers and rules and, you know, things that are just floating around on my wobble bench. So I realized, oops, I better, um, better do something else. So I cotton on to putting a folded up tea towel down there, which is good because it also holds it in place and it's much easier to work on. Because, you know, you're often working at little curves and, and rotated angles. And it's much better to have that there. I mean, probably even like a little bean bag would be probably pretty good as well. Because the thing is, at this point, I can't really put it into the keel clamp. Because we're not working on the top. Well, once we get up and we're working on things higher than the um, the water line, sure, we can, we can work up with a keel clamp. But at the moment, we're working on the bloody keel. So, you know, you're not going to clamp it. All right, so these joggles or joggle planks, and steelers. Now, the reasoning behind it is in a real boat, you've got to nail planks to the frame, right? So your planks, you'll notice I've actually marked each of my plank lengths. When I first planked this, I'd use long strips, so like half meter long strips, to get a nice continuous run. And that's an easy way to do it. I mean, you can do individual planks, but it's a lot of work. And then each one is quite tricky to bend. A big, long plank 
that you've wet and then clamped in as I've done, shown you, it's a lot easier to basically get the correct shape. And it's a lot less things to work with. So what I've done after that is I've measured long here a plank length, okay, and these are about 4 inches, 100 mil, and that, that equates roughly to about a scale plank. That's about the length they were. So um, you've just got to basically multiply that by 50. <laughs> Do your own math. <laughs> uh, each one of these ends in a point that would be on a frame. Now, they're not the frames that are in the kit because those frames were one. They're not there anymore. We're on a second layer. I don't even, can't even see them. I mean, it doesn't matter. So instead, I just basically did a nice starting, starting at a point and just marking every one of them and then staggering them in a planking staggered method, which I'll explain in another video. But anyhow, what I'm getting at is planks then butt together and they are nailed to the bulkhead frame underneath. That's how a real ship is made. So a triangular plank that we put in, like a wedge, it's going to be a bugger of a thing for them to nail. That, well, they couldn't do it. Going to a fine point, that they, they're they not going to be able to nail that securely. So instead, they make them like this, where it has an arrowhead, and the plank still has a reasonable width. Usually no less than half the width of a full plank. So these three planks here end here at what is a join. As these top two here, they were joining there, and I'm yet to put the little holes, nail holes and cork them up. But anyhow, that's the join. So at that point, you can have a little arrow shaped plank, arrow headed plank, and it will allow for the nails to go in, but also the planks either side of it, the two, you know, the three that are going down to two, they can nail in as well. Everybody gets a chance to nail because of that particular arrangement. And that's why they do it. And also it kind of looks neat. I think it looks a lot better than the butt joint. I had three planks running up here, bang. And I also had sort of two joins because I had a butt join there and a butt join there. So I had what's called a short plank there. Whereas this time I made a big long plank, as you're seeing in the photos here. So this time I replaced two planks with my big long plank, which fits a bit better with the whole sort of staggering of the planks. And this one here joins there. That's... Not ideal, but it can be done that way. There's nothing wrong with that. And it just gives a more aesthetic look, and it's more accurate. Now, that's what's called a drop-down, where you're going from 3 to 2, or you can go from 2 to 1. You need to have less planks in there, because you can see how thin they're getting here, and there's no way you could keep tapering them, and they would end up so tiny. And, of course, the, the general rule of planking is don't taper less than half the width of your original plank. So these were 6mm planks, you don't want to go down to 3mm. To in fact, I made it sort of, I didn't want to go down to 4. 4 was my limit. That's how I worked things out. Now, the opposite happens here at the, at the keel and around the dead area. And the reason is you've got this compound curve. Right here, the ship is curving, the hull is curving this way. But at this point, it turns and it comes out that way. So there's a complex curve here. There's a dip down rollout. And because of that, these planks may need to be tapered to be thinner. But here, the planks need to go wider. Now, of course, you've only got the width of the plank. So what you have to do then is you're going to have to put intermediary planks in to all the spaces. And the cheats method, as I'd use, is just to put some wedges in. And there's probably a photo here showing you. But again, what you do is you measure it all up. And instead of having that wedge... You calculate out basically where the where the wedge is going to be. You try and make all the planks even. So you work out it should be that wide to keep this even. So that might be slightly wider than the, the natural wedge that, that occurred there, which was the space because the planks curved up. And then you run it to the next planking join or an appropriate spot where you can basically put a nail in. And here, these aren't a full arrow head. They're a half arrow head, which is perfectly fine for what I'm doing. And I consistently did that all the way through. Each one of these is at the join as they're staggered, and they're all a half arrowhead. And then I made sure that along the edge here where the rudder is, they're kind of all roughly the same width, which aesthetically looks so much better. Because if you if you saw the original, there were sort of thin planks and thick planks and thin wedges and thick planks, and you know, this kind of has reasonable um evenness about it 
and the joins don't look so horrible. All right, so how do we work out where these joggles and steelers go? And then how do we put them in? All right, well, let me show you how I've managed to accomplish it. Now, ideally, you would have a space <laughs> like you would have already planked and then have a little triangular space there going, oh dear, I need to put a steeler in because I've got a little triangular space, which in previous videos I've shown you, here's a little triangular space, make a wedge, put it in. And, and a wedge will do, and a wedge is fine. I'm just taking it a little bit further. What I tend to do in my videos is I have a level of understanding and a level of skill. I always have a look at, could I do better? Is there a better technique? Could I learn something else? And if I accomplish that, well, usually as I accomplish that, I share it with you. So this is something I have learnt only recently, and now I'm sharing it with you. OK, so everyone thinks I know everything all the time. I don't. I'm learning just like you're learning. OK, so there is here. It's probably a bit hard to see, but there is a wedge here. Its apex is there and it comes through to here and here. So it's a silly little sliver, which is rather, you know, I don't know what I was thinking, because up here I've had to drop down. So obviously there wasn't enough room for all the planks there. So why did I need a wedge here? I mustn't have been thinking clearly. So that's something for me to think of when I do the other side, is that if I get a little bit of um, sort of, it tends to fan out a bit, don't worry about that. Maybe it's better to kind of push the planks in and they'll all come good once it gets back to the top here. But anyway, I've got this problem and that's how it's happened. So all the rest of the planking is kind of neat. I've also got a gap here, which I need to fill. I mean, I probably wouldn't worry about this. I would go, I'll uh, leave that as a learning. No one, look, no one's ever going to see it. <laughs> never going to see it. So really, I'm only indulging myself by repairing it. But I have a gap here because I've got planks that are going to go on across there. And as you can see, there's a little chunk missing from there. So I need to fill that anyway. I probably would have to put in some tiny little pieces and see if I can feather them in. And I've also got um, some marks here. So I might end up replacing that plank as well. Don't know. But for the moment, for this video, I'll just show you a technique of replacing a wedge or a wedge hole that you might have put a wedge in with a steeler. OK, so how do we work out where this steeler's got to go? Well, for a start, we'll have a look for the the plank join. Now, if there'd been, if it ended here, I could have, I could have done it here because obviously there will be a bulkhead through there because I've got a plank join. But my next plank join is up here, so I'm going to have to put my steeler in here, which is fine. It's on a plank join, but that's okay. So the arrowhead will be there. Down here at the base, well, I don't want it that thin. That sort of defeats the purpose. It's sort of, it's only like a couple of millimeters thin there. It's ridiculous. So let's measure a few things up. From that plank join running along here, and you'll need a you'll need a measuring tape like this, like a you know, dress making or clothes making tape, <laughs> so that you can get the measurement on a curve, especially complex curves, right? So we're looking at mm, 55 millimeters. So we'll we'll need a little more for waist and just for trimming. So we'll go six, but remember 55. So that's our length. That'll be fine. I'm going to need four millimeters we've decided that so I will need four millimeters at this point okay so basically that's a three anyway that's gone to a four that was a five that'll go to a four so my measurement over here is four millimeters wide there which gives me four millimeters for that plank and I was going to run along that line but really I hadn't thought it through because when I get to here if I use that line of that plank this is not wide enough. If I try and take four millimeters into this, it's going to look, well, it's only a five millimeter plank. Even if I put three millimeters in, it's no good. Again, I can't go to less than half. So again, the kind of thirds rule works. So if we measure here, I've got nine millimeters. Okay, I've started at the 10. I'm going to 19, so that's nine. Now, nine breaks into three lots of three, which is just my minimum width. So okay, we can get away with that. So my wedge is going to need to be three millimeters across there. So let's mark that. So one and a half in. Okay, and it neatly divides all three planks 
into thirds. And we will get a full arrowhead on this one. All right. Up here, I was able to do different sort of steelers because I could split the plank and I could, um, they were eight millimeter planks. Don't ask me why. I'd actually cheated and you started with eight millimeter planks, went down to six millimeter planks. Never do that again. Stay with the same width planks. All right. So with that in place, I now need to go, okay, well, where's my measured point there? So that's my line. And my measured point here is from that previous join. Okay, so now I have my steeler marked. It starts at three millimeters. It ends at four millimeters. It was about 57 long, but we're going to make this six millimeters or six centimeters, right? just so we've got a bit of waste, a bit of play. So we know how to make that shape. So let's do that now. We'll make the shape and when we can sort of place it over there, see if it's going to work. So first I need to make the, um, the oversized plank. And we make everything just a little bit too big because it's always easy to trim down. It's very hard to add more. You just have to start again with wood. So that is going to fit fine, there's plenty of waste, and I'll need a little bit for that arrowhead as well. So on one side I'm going to measure 4mm, and on the other side I'm going to measure 3mm. So that's just a simple matter, penciling it off. And if you're sort of experienced doing this sort of things, you know to allow for parallax and the thickness of the pencil, and you make adjustments for that. So I'll just measure that up and get the rough shape. Again here I'm using a trick where I touch the pencil on the marking point and then slide the rule to it and that will give me the rule positions. All right, just like you do with your plastic modeling, you dry fit. So even before we cut this, we have a look and go, well, how is this actually going to fit? How's it going to look? Not too bad that side. Yep, that'll be fine. And this side, okay, it's good, but I'll need to cut just outside or inside, if you like, of the pencil mark. Because that pencil mark can be up to half a millimetre thick. So by doing the dry fit, you can see whereabouts that pencil mark should I be cutting. Now with this stuff, you cut very light, very carefully. Otherwise, they'll just slide out from underneath you and end up all wobbly. Okay, again, dry fit. Is that going to fit our space? It's looking pretty good. Yep, that plank should be perfect. Okay, so I attach it with a pin. And then with it in place, I will use that plank as a former. Now I could do the other ones with the rule. I could do those, those other steelers I put in. Uh, I could actually get the rule on there. But here I couldn't get the rule to bend quite well around there. So once I had got the line basically cut on the former, I can then run down again with a knife. I've only got to get in half a millimetre, but that then cuts out the shape that I'm going to need to remove. And don't forget to do the arrowhead. Yep, sure. Okay, chisel time. Now it's, um, work slowly. As long as you've scored those sides in, and obviously you'd score a little more than half a millimetre, just to be sure. This um, chisel I've got is only three millimetres wide, so it's a good one for this sort of practice. And I'm trying to keep it as flat and level as I can. Now as you work your way along, the planks are going to get fairly tight and it's going to be a bit hard to get the material out. So what I do there is I score. I score with a knife well on the waist of the plank and it'll lift out nice and easy. So work my way along, chisel, chisel, chisel until you get to the end and take it nice and easy. All right, so did it work? Well, here's my plank, my steeler, and fits perfectly. Now, as I've said, this is curving in a couple of directions so it's going to be a little hard to glue down it's going to spring up so i'm going to need to bend this plank now it's hardly worth getting out the electric iron just to bend this little plank although i will use that electric iron to set it in place what i can do is it's only a short piece of plank and it's only half a millimeter thick all right so what you can do is a little bit of water it's just my drinking water so let's 
splatter that everywhere, Harry. That's right, yes. Cover my desk in it. Electrocute myself because I've got the electric knife out there or the electric plank bender. And we'll give that a bit of a bend just by hand. Roughly. When I put the electric plank bender on it, it will get to shape. Still not enough. I need a bit more of a bend there. So just encourage it. Just gently. So oh, come on. Need a bit of a curve. All right, nearly there. A little bit more over here. A bit more of a curve. Let's see what you got. It's almost there. The tip is just not curving enough here. You could use a little silly plank bed at all, but they're the little pinchy one. But honestly, I find they usually snap these very thin planks. Okay, so dry fit. That's near enough to spit, and that's just about there. There's not much pressure on it at all now. It is literally fitting to shape. And this is the beauty of working with the whiter wood and the thin planks. There we are. Perfect fit. So that's already bent to shape, just like that. And then you can see the fit is pretty good. So now we just need to glue it in, and then we'll put the electric plank bend over it. So we won't need much glue. It kind of slops around anyway. Okay, that's oh, far too much, Harry. Far too much. It's all right. It's all water-based, so we can kind of clean that off. All right, so in goes our plank. Now, although it was wet, it's, well, especially in here, I'm with the air conditioner, and it's a warm day. That's drying as we look at it. And anyhow, this is water-based glue. So... Wipe that clean as much as we can. Now, wipe towards the arrowhead. If you wipe that way, as I found, you accidentally slide the plank out. Or, oh, although there, I've just done it. <laughs> if you apply too much pressure, you will flick the plank out. Yeah. Now I've reused my pin here to hold that in place. And now, very carefully, without burning yourself, Harry, just run the electric plank bend over, which will just smooth it into the hole. It'll also help dry. As soon as you start seeing some brown bits, which is actually the glue burning, that's not actually the um, the wood burning. Those little brown bits there are the glue burning. So that's okay. So stop because we can sand that off. All right, that's in. Basically, we have our stealer. It's done. It certainly wasn't an easy one by any means. Still popping up a little bit there, but if you keep encouraging them down, they uh, they will stick in place. Now, of course, you probably should be doing these when you're just first planking, when you're actually putting the layer on, well, second layer planks, instead of trying to cut in and cut out and make a bloody awful mess like I've done. If you've actually got a wedge-shaped hole there, then it's going to be a lot easier to cut those edges and then flick out the little bit of waste with your model knife, right? So you basically just cut the lines as I did, but then you'd only have to get in there and flick your waste out rather than doing a bloody heavy-handed job with the chisel as I did. So that would be a better way to do it. We might do that when I actually do the planking um, on the other side. I might see if we can do a steeler or a joggle plank and we'll do it for real. But that is kind of the principle of putting in one of these um, steelers. Oh, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Just be nice about it all, okay? Okay, got to go. <laughs> Goodbye for Australia. And it's Hooray from Harry Houdini.